Well, good morning, Southside Bible. This morning we're going to be studying in Romans 8, so if you want to turn there, i got a few announcements. One of the announcements, we we're moving forward with setting trellis for the discipleship, and there's going to be a, a group that's going to be meeting for that discipleship program. Uh, it's for any, uh, whatever life stage you're in. It answers the questions, how, would, how do we respond to life's challenges and pain in a way that will honor God? And so the study helps us close the door on uh, damaged past and open the door to God-filled future. So it's dealing with uh, the hurts that you might be carrying around. And, and the, the goal is uh, to find hope and victory over pain is, is through the application and practice of God's Word. So it's a study book digging in. And so I'll be overseeing that. And there'll be uh, one for the females and one for the males on the, the night. It's in your bulletin there. So, so Romans chapter 8. We're finishing up Romans chapter 8 this morning. Some of you thought we might not ever get there, but <laughs> we are there and we find ourselves really in an amazing portion of Scripture where Paul's been laboring to show us the beauty of the gospel in great detail. And, and we, we took a great ascent in Romans 1 through 3 and saw the darkness of our own hearts and our condition before God under his judgment. And now Paul has been uh, ascending uh, in the gospel, and now we are standing on the top of the mountain called salvation. And Paul is now like calling out to the entire universe, like daring anyone or anything to challenge uh, God's purposes and plan for your lives to bring us safely to glory. And so who can thwart the will of God? And he throws out some really big questions in this section, five of them with, I think, even five bigger answers. Who, who can be against us? God for us. If God is for us, and in this gospel now he is, who then could ever harm us and come and damage or stop the plan of God in your life? Secondly, how will he not freely give us all things now in our journey to glory if he didn't spare his own son? He looked at his own son on the cross and pierced him through for our transgression, the hardest thing God ever had to do. How can, how can he not now help you with whatever you're facing on your journey to glory. Thirdly, who can bring a charge against God's elect? Who can bring any charge that will actually stick? And the answer is it's God who's justified you. No one's going to ever bring up a new charge that he didn't know about. You are completely not guilty before God, and nothing can ever be brought up again into his presence. Fourthly, who could condemn you? Christ Jesus was condemned for all your sins, He's been raised to show that it was a sufficient salvation. He's now seated at the right hand of God. He would never be there unless it was a perfect salvation. And he's interceding right now on your behalf that you will make it to glory. Last question this morning. You kind of look at these four and say, can it get any better? I think so. <laughs> Who will separate us from the love of Christ? And we're, we're going mining for gold this morning. This, this passage is amazing. But what I want to do by way of introduction this morning is, is to get the diamond that we're going to look at, and you've got to put it on its prong. Because many take comfort in this verse wrongly and don't even understand what Paul is really bringing out in this passage. And so I want you to get the fullness of what God wants for you to have from this question this morning. And first, this passage is not Valentine's Day message. It's not flower and cards and nice date and chocolates and a cheesy poem about your love. It's not Hallmark, where it ends and you just feel warm all over. It's the sentimentalism of our day and age of what we've done with God. And I want to come and say, what does this mean? And I'll tell you this, it doesn't mean that. It's not love comes softly. I know it's your favorite movie, Robert, but it, it just isn't that. <laughs> it comes loudly, bold, purposeful, and sovereign. Amen. Takes you over and accomplishes its purpose. There's nothing softly about God taking over your life in this passage. It's not God loves me so much he can't live without me. I want you to get what this really is, and I want you to see what you have been brought into You've been brought into Romans 8, 28, that there's a God now who loves you, 
And he is causing all things in your life to work together for the good of conforming you to his son. Uh, it, it, the whole salvation started in verse 29 with his foreknowledge where he set his love on you in eternity past. And when God loves you, great things happen. And he brings all this justification. He's going to bring you to glory because God has set his love on you. Nothing can break this chain. I think I still have it. Nah, forget it. People, this is a love where people come against you. They bring charges against you. They condemn you and they persecute you this morning. They try to put you to death. All hell is trying to destroy you. That's our context in our passage. This is Paul telling us, how do I stand and fight and persevere on my way to glory with all these things against me? I have to take my thoughts captive to the Lord Jesus Christ. This love is infinite. It's holy. It's purposeful. It's sovereign. It's immutable. It's a foreknowledge. It's a massive work through the Lord Jesus Christ. For those who believe in him and for those who trust him, it's a blessed assurance that Jesus is mine, and that's what I'm asking God to give every believer in this room. Blessed assurance. What this could do for every soul in this room is remarkable, and I've been praying hard for it. That nothing from within me can separate me from God's love, and nothing from outside can separate me from God's love in Christ Jesus. Let's pray. Father, I pray that your spirit would illuminate this truth into every mind and heart. I pray that freedom would break in to minds that don't all the way believe this, that are struggling with it and wrestling with it and listening to lies. God, let them hear the truth of your word and let the spirit speak. Speak to their hearts. God, I pray if there are any who have come into our midst, and they've been running around trying to find love their whole lives. This is what they've been looking for. And I pray this morning, open their eyes to Jesus Christ and let them find this infinite love that nothing can separate you from. God, do that work perfectly in each heart this morning for what they need. I pray in the name of Christ. Amen. As we begin... What are some of the things that make this passage hard? Remember we talked about epignosis, where you get it. You get the full knowledge. You, you understand it. What, what is hard about believing that God loves me and nothing can separate me from it? Well, Paul said the just shall live by faith at the beginning of Romans. And this morning, he's going to say sword is going to come against you, peril, famine, nakedness, so many things are going to come against you in your journey to glory that they, they preach sometimes the opposite of God's love. And so you're going you're gonna to look out there and you're going to struggle to really know the love of God as, as these hard things are coming into your life. And secondly, it's hard that someone could know me deeply and still love me. It, it makes relationships really hard when, you, when we live in this insecurity, and so to, to be known and be vulnerable uh, has a high probability of rejection. And there, there are narcissists who, you know, I'm, I'm just so happens I'm a great guy and you could be Mrs. Great Guy. They're, they, they, they're proud of themselves. But deep down in all of us, uh, we have been known and, and we've been rejected. And we long so deeply to be accepted and to be known and loved and it messes with us a lot of our lives. And then we get saved. And there's a hangover called remaining sin. And I grew up in a setting where you had to, you had to work for God's love. And you had to earn it. And so there, there's a hangover that I have to fight daily. And this passage comes and says, nothing can separate us from the love of God. And we can quote it. Got a little verse card. Okay, it was in your Awana club. But secretly, we, we worry about it. And when we blow it, first thing that comes in your mind, how could he, how could he really love me? When a hard providence comes, we, we say, D does he really love me? And so what this passage is telling me is that God's purpose, that he, he causes all things to work together for good, to sinner ghetto, 
into your life that trials and tribulations are God's love. And they don't separate me from it. They don't prove that he doesn't love me. Uh, back to Romans 5, 3. And not only this, but we also exult in our tribulations. Knowing that tribulation brings about perseverance and perseverance proven character and proven character hope. And hope does not disappoint because the love of God has been poured out within our hearts through the Holy Spirit who was given to us. And so there's the connection with trials and and in teaching and knowing the love of God uh, in them. And so we've got to renew our minds to think rightly about what God's love is, what it will look like, and how to believe it and live into it and trust it. And, and, and most of us have this in us that his love is not trials. Uh, we might know it academically, but in our heart, when they come and squeeze enough, uh, man, God is against me or he doesn't love me. And so there is a way, I want you to hear this, to embrace anything that comes into your life with even joy, because God loves you, and those he loves, he glorifies. No matter how bad the stuff on the inside is, whatever sins and stuff I'm battling on the inside, no matter how bad the stuff is from the outside coming at me this morning, believer in Christ... God loves you. And the call here is we have to believe this by faith. We've looked at the work of Christ for a year. We look at it. We believe it. Despite what we see or what we perceive in our lives, here's the fight of faith. You're looking at things. You're perceiving it. It doesn't feel like love. It doesn't look like love. And I've got to fight the fight of faith. And so are you hearing me? You can't interpret God's love for you by what you think, by what you perceive, by what you experience, by what you feel. It's the opposite of half of what you hear on the radio. You cannot interpret God's love that way. You must interpret it by Calvary's tree, the cross of Jesus Christ. You must interpret it by a God who foreknew and predestined you and called you and justified you and is going to glorify you. That is to live by faith and not by the scene. This is the call for the church of God to live by faith. I heard a good example this week of the city of Dothan. Two things we read about in the city of Dothan in the Old Testament. (coughs) Joseph was thrown into a pit there by his brothers when they were jealous of him. And he's praying, get me out of here. Don't let me be sold into slavery. And he's sold into slavery, and he goes into a hard, dark, long trial. Does God love him? Why did God not pull him out of the pit? Because there's a famine that would strike and would have destroyed his whole family and the nation of Israel and where the seed of Jesus would come from. God raised up Joseph to be the highest in command next to Pharaoh for such a time as this. And the 10 plagues and the picture of the deliverance from slavery and all that took place, uh, it was love to leave him in the pit. The other time in Dothan is Elisha has all these armies encamped against him and they're going to destroy him. And he prays for rescue just like Joseph. And God sends the chariots of fire and they destroy all of their enemies with this amazing victory. What great love. In both cases in Dothan, God loved them. And what I'm asking you this morning is to trust that if you're still sitting in a pit. Or if you're right off an amazing miracle of what God has done in your life. It's the, God works all things for good. And I trust his heart and what he's doing in my life. And so who will separate us from the love of Christ? And so let's look at that in verse 35. You have to make an interpretive call as you begin. It's called a genitive in the Greek. So it could be translated, our love to Christ or Christ's love to us. And this one's pretty easy because if it was our love to Christ, everything in that list would separate us from it. But it's Christ's love to us that we are looking at this morning that nothing can separate you from believer in Christ. What love is this? Well, the context is, is the bride of Christ. So who is it that he loves? He's called them his elect. He's called them the ones I foreknew. 
the ones that I've predestined to be conformed to my son, the ones that I've called, the ones that I've justified, the ones that Jesus will lay his life down for. My sheep hear my voice and they follow me. He said, I will lose none of them and raise them up on the last day. These are the ones in our passage, so I want you to see these are the ones that the love of Christ is upon. The ones who have faith in his work and trust in it are the ones who have the love of Christ. Without that, you don't have the love of Christ. And so this is for his bride. This is for his redeemed ones, the ones who have faith and have come to Christ and surrendered their lives to him. That's who we're talking about this morning. And so I want to make sure you got it right. Who can separate us, us believers, from the love of Jesus Christ. The the Greek word for separate is karizo, not chorizo, karizo. There's a big difference. One will give you indigestion. Here's how it's used. 1 Corinthians 7.10, but to the married I give instructions, not I but the Lord, that the wife should not leave her husband. And so it referred to separation, divorce, leaving. Uh, Departing. Romans 7, 4, my brethren, you were made to die to the law through the body of Christ. And so this is a a death, a separation, a dividing. And so the question this morning then is, can anything carizo us from the love of Christ? And so where we're moving now is into this beautiful marriage context, Christ and the bride. That which all of marriage points to. We looked at it this morning in Sunday school. It's typology that that Christ married the bride. And now we're we're looking at that. We're in a marriage to Jesus Christ. So why does God hate divorce? Because you enter into a covenant on an altar before God. And you vow, I'll love you what? In sickness and in health, in joy and in sorrow, Barry, in plenty and in want. Sorry, man. Is the cat out of the bag? Sweet. Barry and Juliana got engaged. Hallelujah. So God be the glory for that one. So listen, Barry, sickness and in health, joy and in sorrow, plenty and in want, and famine and in nakedness. It's a, it's a lot like the list we're going to look at in this passage. And so you vow, husbands, to model a love like Jesus Christ to his bride, the church, And Jesus said this, I will never leave you and I will never forsake you when you make this covenant with me of salvation. Our union is eternal. Nothing can separate you from my love. I will never discover anything in you, says Jesus, that will cause me to carizo my marriage with you. Nothing will ever cause that to happen. Nothing can come into our marriage with Christ that will ever pull you out of his arms. And that's the word Paul uses. Can anything cause me to carizo my love with Jesus called divorce? Can he discover something in me that will make him leave? And some of you live daily. What what do you think of that this morning? And the answer is, well, I, I need to believe that. Because I counsel a lot who don't believe that. And I want you to hear Jesus on this, not Ken Murphy and not your condemning heart, and not your guilty charges that are being thrown at you. I want you to hear Jesus Christ. And so what Paul is going to do is he's going to pick the strongest and most probable things that could carito our marriage to Christ, and he's going to hold them up to us. And the the things that could endanger this love, and he's going to throw them out there, and what you're going to see is an indestructible love that Jesus Christ has for the child of God. The love that you have been looking for your whole life, right here in Christ. There's a hymn writer who captured it better than any, any, any song I've ever heard, at least country songs. Um, <laughs> if, I wish we had our hymnals still, but, oh, love that will not let me go. One of the great hymns of the faith, oh, love that will not let me go. The writer who wrote that was engaged, and when he was engaged, he went blind, And when he went blind, his fiance left him. He knew a love that would let him go. But he found a better love that would not let him go. And that's the love that we're going to look at this morning. 
So let's look at the list of things that cannot break the bonds of his love, Christ's love. The things that might be regarded by believers that could cause Christ's love to wane. And so the assurance we're looking at in this passage is all powers inside you and outside of you cannot separate you from the love of Christ. Nothing can separate it. And let's look. Uh, I think I sent out an outline. If, if we're there, let's throw it up there. Uh, seven possible forces uh, to try to separate us from the love of Christ. So if you'll look with me in verse 35. Will tribulation, uh, this word means hard circumstances pressing down upon us. So the word really had a lot to do with pressure. In fact, the English word comes from the Latin noun tribulum, and it was a threshing hedge. And so in the ancient world, at the time of the grain harvest and the stalks of grain, they were brought into what's called the threshing floor, and there was this wooden threshing instrument, and it kind of was, looked like a sled. Uh, covered on the bottom with strips of metal. And that metal then was just drug over the stalks to separate the, the head of the grains from the chaff. And the instrument was called a tribulum because it would just press out the grain. And the, pre the picture produced the idea embodied in this word this morning, tribulation. Because circumstances come and they press down on people so forcefully and unremittingly that it seems to them that they're going to be threshed like the stalks of grain. And for some of you, it's very easy to picture this word this morning. We sat at John's son's funeral last week, and that week he found out his little grandson's cancerous brain tumor came back, and he's a year and a half old. Many tribulations and your strength may be almost gone, yet this, brethren, cannot separate you from the love of Jesus Christ. It can only draw you deeper into it. So I want you to hear that. Tribulation cannot separate you from this love. Will distress, the Greek word is two words, stenos, means narrow. Jesus said, enter at the stenos way, the narrow way in Matthew 7. The other word is quora, space or territory. So uh, it, it's not so much being pressed down, but rather being confined within a, a narrow, oppressive space. Uh, sometimes it could just be you're at a dead-end job. You're a mom with children, young children, and a slim budget, and a husband who treats you more like a dog than a helpmate. Everything just feels like it's closing in on you, and it just feels like life is narrowing. And the answer is, can that separate you from the love of Christ? It may narrow now, but you're an heir of heaven. And one day your horizons, one man said, will be as vast as the universe and as soaring as the stars. Nothing can separate you from the love of Christ, not even distress. Thirdly, can persecution, being pursued by someone who is intent to harm you. The, the, their harm is relentless. They're going to get you. They're going to spread slander, strife, try to harm you. And, and it's just growing in our land. It's going to increase for those who love Jesus Christ. And will that separate you? The persecutions may separate us from the love of this world, but they'll never separate you from Jesus' love. And he says, well, famine. This word just simply means hunger. Some, some of you just months ago were homeless. And you know what it means to be hungry. Can hunger separate you? And then nakedness. That, that word really carries the idea of extreme economic hard times, things that not many of us know or understand. And so it could get so hard that there's famine and there's actually nakedness where I can't even afford clothes. Will that separate us from the love of Christ? Sixthly, he said danger. Danger is just because you're Christians. In some countries right now, Christians are being arrested. They're being imprisoned. What we saw in Afghanistan earlier was unbelievable. There's danger. And that danger can lead to, seventhly, the sword. It pushes the violence to the furthest extreme where you are killed for your faith. And we think of those, ev those early martyrs of Stephen being stoned and James. And Paul soon will, will have that sword cut his head off as he writes these words. And soon a trail of Christian blood will mark the progress of the gospel from land to land throughout history. 
And so martyrdom is actually prophesied in verse 36 from Psalm 44. And so just as it is written, for your sake, we're being put to death all day long. We were considered as sheep to be slaughtered. And so this persecution is going to come heavy upon us. And what we need to know as it increases and mounts is that it won't be able to separate me from the love of Christ. It cannot. And then in verse 37, there's this word Allah means, but on the complete opposite. We're not those who are going to be separated from his love as the, the pressures come. But in verse 37, but rather on the complete opposite, believer. And all these things, all these pressures and six, seven things we just went over, all the things that will come upon you, we are going to overwhelmingly conquer. How are we going to conquer? Through him, the whole book of Romans. We're going to conquer through Christ who loved us. And so it's not going to separate you from the love of Christ. Thank you. Anybody else got one for me? (laughs) That's a good brother. I love it. So we overwhelmingly conquer. This word for conquer, one Greek word, nikao. Nikao, where we get the word Nike. That's why we call our... Our, uh, our, our fellowship group called the Nike Group. And just to clear the air right now, I've been having a lot of fun joking, joking about that. The age used to be 50 to go to the Nike Group. And every year I have a birthday, we lift it. <laughs> it's just been a joke. So I want you to know the age really is 50. And because uh, some of you were, I almost got crucified the last party. So just Nike's on. 50 and older, okay? So everybody 50 and older, you come to that. But it means to overcome or conquer. That's what that group is, overcomers, conquerors in their faith, their season. They've walked with God. Praise God for the seasoned saints. And in the word hyper in front of it means in place of or more than. It's where we get our English word hyper. And so when you say hyperextension, it extended too far. It went more than. Hyper-Calvinism, it goes more than what the scriptures say to where you throw out human responsibility. So we will get the eternal victory. We're going to be conquerors. We're going to overcome more than in place of. And it may look like we are losing, and it might feel like we are, but I just want you to look at what's going on right now in your country, your life. You're going to be a, a nakao. You're going, to, you're going to overcome. You're going to conquer in Christ. Christ has won you have won. You're going to be victors. You're going to be the overcomers because of Christ praying for you, interceding, helping you get to glory. So I just want you to think with the victor's mindset. Don't walk around defeated and all of that. You're going to be a victor because of Jesus Christ. You're attached to him. And so you're not going to, even if the sword comes on your head, it's going to bring you to your victory. So you can't lose, Christian. You're, you're a nakao. You are an over. Comer, because Christ overcame the grave and death. So our reward will surpass anything ever attained by earthly conquerors. The kings of this world, when they won, they fought, they fought for territory. They fought for wealth. They fought for glory. The army would fight because they would get a share of the spoils. Uh, they, they get their earthly rewards, but our reward is going to be heaven. The full embrace of our Savior In the arms of my dear Savior, oh, there are 10,000 charms. I will overcome, I'll be a victor, and I'm going to fellowship with Christ forever. Paul said, do you not know that those who run in a race all run, but only one receives the prize? Run in such a way that you may win, and everyone who competes in the games exercises self-control in all things. They then do it to receive a perishable wreath, but we an imperishable wreath. In this life, We may wear nothing but a crown of thorns, but in heaven we'll wear a crown that will not fade away. And Jesus, and they overcame him because of the blood of the lamb, because of the word of their testimony. They did not love their life even to death. So we're overcomers because of the love of Christ. And so now we come to the close of this whole section. And Paul is going to give us now a personal testimony, and he shifts back to writing in the first person. And the last time he did that was in verse 18. 
uh, for I consider that the, the, the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory that's to be revealed to us. And he's given us all of his arguments. And now we get to hear, I love this, when Paul puts you on his knee and says, let me share my heart. Let me tell you my personal convictions from all that we've learned and all that we've studied. And so look with me in verse 38. For I am convinced, this Greek word means persuaded. It's in the perfect tense. It means I, 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 I am right now, I'm persuaded with a continuing uh, result. And so I, I'm convinced of this. I'm still convinced of it. I'm living into it. It's settled. I know it. And it's in the passive voice, which means something has acted on him that's convinced him. And what's convinced him as we've journeyed Romans is doctrine, truth. Paul has been looking at all the truths of God's word. So we, we learn the doctrines of salvation and justification, all that we've been looking at, sanctification, glorification. We, we learn these and we say, I'm convinced that God's for me, that he loves me. And then there's experience. Paul's lived his life and in living his life, the love of Christ has held him and it's still holding him and it's gonna hold him to the very end when that sword drops on his neck. Here's a man just standing with his armor on, close to death. He fought the devil. He fought himself. Uh, he fought being beaten, shipwrecked, stoned, and that whole list. Here's a man, just picture what he's been through. He's gone to the depths and the heights. He's despaired. He's gloried. He's a beaten piece of meat. And this is Paul's conclusion. As I've lived my life, nothing shall be able to separate us from the love of God. And that needs to be the conclusion of everyone in this church. This is what I've been laboring for for two years. I look at my life. I still love him. I've gone through COVID. I still believe in him. I still trust him. After 35 years of being a Christian, I'm still in his arms. I'm convinced that nothing can separate me from the love of God. And that's what I need for everyone in here. And now Paul's going to pick the greatest forces imaginable, and he's going to set them in battle array against us to see again that nothing can separate us. And these are the things that a lot of times we believe will. And so as we knock them down, what I'm asking is if, if that is in your mind this morning, let the Word of God knock it down. And let the only thing be standing when we're finished with this is I am loved by Christ indestructibly. Death. Verse 38. I'm, I'm convinced that neither death nor life. And I think that's probably one of the most fearful things of all is in Hebrews 2 talked about that fear of death that holds men all their days. If you're visiting here and you're not a Christian, I, I, I sure, I know, I've walked it. You are afraid of death. And you should be. And what we're going to learn is how we, we cannot be. And how when we die, it can't separate us from his love. Francis Bacon said, men fear death as children fear the dark. And we see why. Because in Romans 5, it's as death came because of Adam's sin. So sin and condemnation spread through the whole world. We weren't made to die. And when he sinned, death entered the world. And death, there's such a finality to it. It's such a separator. Anyone who's tasted it, you know how hard it is. And it separates us from life itself. It separates from the people who we know and love. It separates the soul from the body. But I want you to hear this. There's one thing it can't separate us from. The love of God, which is in Christ Jesus. It just, it's a separator, but not of the love of Christ. So separate me because I'll be joined to the one who I cannot be separated from. In fact, rather than separating, it ushers us into the fullness of it. Winslow said, death is the birthday of our immortality. So I ask you this, are you convinced? Because everything he's been writing in this book is to convince you. Death can't separate me from this. That will change people's, that'll change everything about you. And the world will look at you and they'll want to know the hope within you. They do not know what to do with people who are genuinely not afraid of death because Christ went into it and conquered it for us. But what I hear most often is from the Christians is I'm not afraid of death 
I'm afraid I'm going to live. Life is hard. And the longer I live, the more chances of shipwrecking my life, my faith. So many temptations and trials that come at me. And Paul's saying, not even life can separate you from his love. So death can't. And and your, your years on this earth, your life cannot separate you from the love of Christ. Can angels or principalities, can they separate us then from this love? And the diabolos, that word actually means separator. So the devil is a a separator. And and so he separates people. He's always working in the body of Christ to separate you. He's evil and he's deceitful and he's a separator. Even if you squared off though with the devil himself, Paul's saying he can't separate you from the love of Christ. I I don't have to fear Satan taking me away from Christ's love. He doesn't have that power. He can't do it. He's a separator of everything but Christ's love for you. Go right down Colossians 2, 13 through 15. I'm running out of time. Beautiful. He made a public display of those principalities and angels when he triumphed over them through his death. Fourth, nor things present. And I want you to hear this. Anything that you're facing right now, whatever you walked in with this morning that is weighing on you, what is it? Depression? Heavy heart? Financial burdens? Loneliness? Health? Stack whatever it is up here. I just want you to hear this. It can't separate you from the love of Christ. Nor things to come. What help for anxiety, huh? I read something yesterday. It was, you know, when you you get on a plane and people fall asleep. I'm one of them. And you're like, how do you, you don't even know the pilot. And you're sleeping on a plane like you're in heaven. And I'm thinking, why can't we do that with life? God is the pilot. He's promised he's going to bring you to glory. And we run around ringing our, just, man. He's got it. He's got it. This is your greatest fear for some of you is the future. And I want you to look into the future and I want you to realize that no matter what is in it, it can't separate you from the love of Christ. Everything that will come into our lives will come through the filter of God's love. Powers. We've had a some, several who have come to this church who have come out of the occult in the last year. They've come out of witchcraft. And I'll tell you, there, there's some scary things that you have seen and what you have shared with me. And what I want you to hear, what Paul just threw out there, powers can't separate you from the love of Christ. It can't separate you. I want you to be done fearing the occult and all that stuff of your past. It, it can't separate you from Christ. You're held with an eternal bond. Powers can't separate you. Nor height, nor depth. Paul looks around now at space. Where can I flee from your presence? Just wherever I go, height, depth cannot separate you. I can go to to the lows of my spiritual life. I can go to the heights. Wherever I go, nothing can separate you from the love of Christ. No matter how down, discouraged, where you've been, you can't be separated from his love. Jonah, I love it. It just says he went down to Joppa. He went down to the boat. He went down into the sea. Just down, 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 down. But the cord of the love of Christ comes and swallows him up with a whale and rescues him and delivers his soul. Not even these depths can break you from the love of Christ. And I've I've counseled long enough, you can go deep in the depths. And it just overwhelms me that no matter how deep it is this morning, the love of Christ is deeper and it can't be separated. A broken brain cannot separate you from Jesus Christ. Some of you just need to know that. You like the list? I almost feel like Paul's just so confident. And so he takes out the last one now and he just whips it up there. <laughs> Nor any other created thing. I can't think of anything else. Anything else created. In case you didn't get the first points, it's like he ran out of possible separators. Okay, I threw them out there. Okay, this, this one's real simple. 
That is anything other than God, because everything else has been created. And so there's nothing that has ever been created that can separate you from the love of Christ. Nothing exists that could ever do that. <laughs> Are you convinced as you look at Jesus Christ this morning? Are you certain of our two years of looking at every verse in Romans and trying to understand it? Are you smarter or are you convinced by what we've looked at that this Christ loves me with an indestructible love? Has your life proven it? Because every testimony we could spend hours just hearing again and again and what your life is, I shouldn't be here this morning. But this love of Christ held me when I tried to run away, when I struggled. It, it just, he keeps me. And I, I'm convinced that he's going to hold me and intercede to the very end. And so guys, this is a must for the Christian. Spurgeon said the distinguishing mark of a Christian is his confidence in the love of Christ and the yielding of his affections to Christ in return. The distinguishing mark of a Christian is his confidence in the love of Christ, and therefore he yields his affections to Christ in return. We love because he first loved us. That's how you get Romans 8, 4, the requirement of the law fulfilled in us when you get what I'm talking about this morning. You must close with Christ you must take him to be your portion. And so what I'm asking as we close out Romans 8, I'm not asking if you're religious. I'm not even asking if you come to church every Sunday. I'm not even asking you if you read your Bible or if you have orthodox doctrine. I'm asking you from this truth in your life, are you convinced that nothing can separate you from the love of God in Christ Jesus? Has God shed abroad in your heart the love of God in Christ Jesus? I pray that this word has convinced you. I pray that you can stand with Paul and say, I'm convinced. I want you to listen to how John Rippon put it. He said, how firm a foundation, ye saints of the Lord, is laid for your faith in his excellent word. What more can he say than to you he hath said, to you who for refuge to Jesus have fled. Fear not, I am with thee. O be not dismayed. For I am thy God, and I will still give thee aid. I'll strengthen thee, help thee, and cause thee to stand, upheld by my righteous, my righteous omnipotent hand. When through fiery trials thy pathway shall lie, my grace all sufficient shall be thy supply. The flame shall not hurt thee, I only design. Thy dross to consume and thy gold to refine. The soul that on Jesus hath leaned for repose, I will not, I will not desert to his foes. That soul, soul though all hell should endeavor to shake, I'll never, no, ne no, never, no, never forsake. And so saints of God, nothing can carizo you from the marriage that you have to Jesus Christ. No force in all of creation can break this indestructible marriage. You will be at the marriage supper of the Lamb. And so I want you to rest in this love. It's the only love that it cannot grow and it cannot diminish. It's infinitely perfect. And so I want you to rest in unchanging love. I always like that story of Spurgeon. He was walking around and uh, there, there was a barn. And this, this guy who owned it, it had a weather vane. And the weather vane on it, it said, God is love. And, and it was blowing in the wind. And Spurgeon said, boy, that, I have a problem with that weather vane because how could God's love be so wavering? And the guy says, oh, you've, you've missed what it means, Mr. Spurgeon. It, it means that God is love whichever way the wind blows. <laughs> That's what I'm trying to say this morning. This love is infinite. And everything that he will bring into your life he has predestined and he's using it to conform and to make you into the image of Christ. And I can't perceive his love by what I think or understand or how I'm looking at it. God is asking you to put your head on this pillow that he loves you. 
in Christ Jesus, and nothing can separate you from that. Application. Deuteronomy 7, 7, the Lord did not set his love on you, Israel, nor choose you because you were more in number than any of the peoples, for you were the fewest of peoples. So why did you love Israel? Because I chose to. I set my love on them, and it wasn't because they were special. It was just because I did, sovereignly. And have any of you ever had a spouse look at you cute and say, do you love me? Yes. Why? Why do you love me? And guys, you got you to get this right. <laughs> Don't say what our, our world says, because you're so beautiful, because you're so smart. You're just so fun, because it will become your identity. But here's the danger. Let's say, Laura, why do you love me? I love you because of your beautiful, thick hair. I was going to show a picture in high school, man. It was beautiful. <laughs> And there's a chance it can go away. And because you're, how about, but you, I love you because you're such a hard worker. What's going to happen when you lose your job? God does not say, I love you because you're so good. Not because you're better than others. You're such good raw material is why I love you. So what's going to happen when you blow it? God says, I love you because I do. I chose to love you in Christ. I set my love on you in eternity past. I love you because I do. I don't have to be smarter, better, accomplish things for God to love me. The freedom in this is unbelievable. He loves you because of his free, sovereign grace and will. And because it wasn't who you were, what you did, you can't lose it. Just he put it on you and he's telling you here, I'll never, you'll never come out from under it. There's nothing that can bring you out from under my love. I chose to put it on you, and it's going to bring you to glory, and you're going to bask in it forever, forever. I had a mentor of mine draw this out in closing. This really hit me this week. I'm thinking of the Garden of Gethsemane saying, Father, if you will, let this cup pass from me. And then he goes to the tree, and he goes up on that tree on our behalf. And Jesus is just watching everybody betray him. Abuse like we have never seen. Anger and hatred and insults are being hurled at him. They're mocking him, making fun of him as a king. Nails are being driven into him. And Jesus could stop this at any time. I could call a legion of angels at any time and stop this. Why didn't you? Why did you stay on that cross? That's love. Bomb after bomb coming down on Christ to get him to drop us, to separate us from his love. And nothing could. He stayed. Nothing could separate his love for you. He never let you go, no matter what was thrown at him on that cross. He won't abandon you now. Do you think he will because you had a bad week? Because you're failing in your trial? Because of hard things in your life? Could he quit loving you now when he just stayed on that cross for you? If you spend a billion dollars on a present, are you going to skimp on the wrapping paper? <laughs> this is the love that you have been trying to find in all these other places. Let it comfort and empower you to trust and live for him on a certain path to glory. Be free to now go love him and love others because of such an amazing love. And so I want to close out with maybe a picture for, for any unbeliever who came in here this morning. You might have come in thinking you were a believer and you're sitting here going, I don't know. Let's look at it. I'm going to draw a picture here. Is what Paul has painted in Romans is that because of sin... You're under the wrath of God, he said. You're, you're under his condemnation. In Romans 1.18, the wrath of God is revealed against all ungodliness. That's the state of every one of us. We're born into this under God's wrath, under his condemnation. You can put your fingers in your ears and say, ooh, I can't hear you. But God is telling you that's the reality that you're sitting in this morning. 
and, and ignoring it isn't going to change anything. And now I want you to come over to this other beautiful sphere called the love of Christ. This infinite love that we just looked at where you're, you're forgiven and you're accepted, you're adopted, God's for you, he's, he's interceding for you, he's, he's given you everything in this beautiful sphere. And the question is, how do I go from here to here? How does a guy go off to the Marines angry, hating God, and come back smiling, going, Jesus is everything, and he's under God's love now and safe? How does that happen? Well, Jesus Christ is the door. And he said, I'm the door. No one can come into this sphere except through me. You can't go from condemnation to love and acceptance by good works, church, nothing. There's no other way in but through Jesus Christ who came and died on a cross for your sins. He bore the wrath of God in your place. He lived the life that you should have. He's the only way to go from condemnation to this amazing love that I've been talking about and looking at. And so I pray if you are trying to get to this place of love any other way, it will end in, in, in condemnation. And so to just say, I'm just going to repeat it to myself every morning till it's true. Um, I'm just a good guy. I'm better than the guy down the street. All of those things are going to abort on the last day. Christ has come into the world to bring you into this sphere. And once he brings you in it, nothing can ever take you out of it. I just love it. You can't take yourself out of it. Do you hear that? Nothing can bring you out of this love. And it's eternal and forever. And, and you have that through Jesus Christ. So believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. Come to him. Surrender to him. And he's the way to enter into this beautiful, amazing love that I have just described. Let's pray. Father, I thank you for this beautiful passage. I pray that everyone in this room, Lord, would be convinced like Paul. We would be convinced now that you love us with a love that is eternal and unchanging. Nothing can ever be a separator of it. And so many of us live with a, a wrong understanding or a fear of being separated from it. God, would you remove all of that fear this morning as we gaze into the face of Jesus Christ? Lord, it's a love that nothing can separate it. The cross couldn't separate it. The cross was the picture of it. And he chose it because he loved us and loved his Father. Oh God, let that overwhelm and overtake hearts this morning. If, if, if that didn't separate his love, man, nothing Nothing in me, nothing outside of me will ever be able to separate it. God, let this make people bold, courageous, radical, lay their lives down to love the way he's loved us. God, let us forbear, be forgiving, kind, all the fruit of the Spirit, Corinthians 13, Beatitudes. Father, let us be a people now who respond to this love the way you, you, you desire for us. And so I pray, fill this bunch with the knowledge of your love that is, has a height and a depth and a breadth and a length that we cannot understand. And Lord, let it flow uh, into, the, into this world and into every life that you bring our way. God, thank you for such a glorious gospel. And it's in Christ's name that we do pray. Amen.